<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 10 of, of Two Andrews, One Barbell. I'm here with Andrew, Andrew Blackwood. I'm Andrew Rowe. Uh, we're in a new setting, if yeah. you haven't noticed. Yeah, yeah. Hope more intimate feel. Well, it feels very intimate under the table. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is very yeah, nice. I yeah, feel very close to you. I, I don't know if this will be the setup going forward, but it'll do for this one. It'll do. I like the way our toes can interconnect easily <laughs> without having to extend my knee too much. When these are this, is, this is the vibe already, is it? The vibe oh. already? It hasn't changed. It's been the vibe for the last 10 yeah. episodes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay. how are you? Yeah, I'm pretty good. How yeah. are you? I'm working away. <laughs> I'm working away. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Um, just got over that hump of submitting my thesis. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's in there. Um... Man. Yeah, tell me about because I've been trying to talk to you for like the past week <laughs> <laughs> and I will uh, not hear back from him. I thought he was dead. I'm I actually sorry. thought I was going to have to drive out to his house and see sorry. if he's still alive. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I am bad. For that. I'm bad at replying to everyone. Yeah. Uh, and we talk probably the, the most, most of anyone I talk to. So when you you know when I'm not replying to you, <laughs> yeah, it's there's something. Serious. Um, but no, so I have my thesis due this week. I've been working on that since September. Uh, I don't know if I've talked about it on the podcast, but can I, can I actually interrupt? Because I dropped out. What is a thesis? I actually don't even know what a thesis is. <laughs> Man, so a thesis, dissertation, it's better just call it a final year project. Yeah. So you project in your final year. Yeah. Now, obviously, you can do a thesis or dissertation outside of your final year. Okay. Mm. So for us, it was a research paper. So you had to okay. conduct a piece of psychological research and write up a report. So I don't know if you've read psychological papers, or not even psychological <laughs> papers, but just scientific papers. Why do you think I dropped out, man? <laughs> I couldn't read. Uh, so uh, a paper basically just has, you know, an introduction, yeah. which is like the background, yeah, and the justification yeah. for doing it. Yeah. Uh, it explains how it was there's done. An, there's an abstract in there. There's an abstract. Oh, yeah. Hey, see? Yeah. I see, learned you have read. Hey, uh, biomed, it stuck to me. Man, will I send you mine, actually? And you can, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> how long is the abstract? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can I read the intro? Do you have yeah. a blurb? Like, the, the abstract is a blurb. Oh, easy. Okay. I'll read that. Read that. Yeah. Uh, the introduction, the method section explains how it's done. Yeah. The results are what you found. The discussion is discussing the results in light of the background research. Yeah. Yeah. What does this mean? What are the implications? Any limitations to your study? Conclusion. Yeah. Mine was, I did my placement in one of the Irish services for brain injury, okay. like post-acute yeah. care. So obviously you go to hospital when you have a brain injury, yeah. and then you go to somewhere like the NRH or the National Rehabilitation Hospital, where you go from, you know, just out of hospital, so like very little function in most cases, you know. And is this people who like w they hit their head or something? Is that what you're doing? Every, right? Man, everything yeah. like from hitting their heads. Like I, I had a guy who really lovely his name was Paul. Yeah. Uh, he was a builder, yeah. and f on a ladder and fell just straight back onto his head, man. Yeah. Uh, a lot of car accidents, um, even strokes, tumors, okay. things like that. Yeah, I can cause brain injury. Yeah. Uh, so I did that there in Dunleary uh, in a clubhouse yep. and it was amazing so I said fuck it like I'd rather do my thesis on something complex but something I'm interested in yep. and something bullshit like, like you like know that. the effect of scrolling on your phone or something yeah. I'm sure people did that and yeah. if you're interested in it that's perfect but I realised over the years that I'm more interested in the neuropsychological part of psychology which is basically connecting tissue and areas of the brain <laughs> through brain damage to yeah. behaviours and function I like so it. I couldn't work with the clients themselves clients, service users, whatever, uh, because it's too vulnerable of a population. Uh, things about consent and the information they provide and their capacity to understand what they're providing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, every, like if, if they could be completely fine, um, but it's just, it is a cohort where when you're looking for ethical approval, a which is a big part of the process. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, this is interesting. Okay. It's very difficult. Yeah. It's very difficult to get approval. Uh, and I actually had a lecture recently where the lecturer was like, why the fuck can't, like it, it's bollocks yeah. that we can't work with uh, cohorts like that very easily because they're the ones that actually matter. Yeah. Like if you had a brain injury, it's you that wants to give your opinion on the service. Uh, so it's very important and I hope to do that maybe in the future if I, I'm applying to master's right now. Uh, so if I get those ticked off, those are the students that will have an easier time yeah. getting yeah, approval. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ethically, it's still going to be difficult. Um, but So what I did was uh, I said, well, I'll interview psychologists who work in brain injury services uh, um, because there's a lot of research. No, there's not a lot of research in the area. There was one done like 10 years ago, a research paper that looked at the perspectives of psychologists uh, and the families of people with brain injuries, just about services and how they could improve. And say they, they mentioned a bunch of things that we don't do very well. One of the main things being that the services are all centered in Dublin, understandably. Okay. So yeah, if people have to travel like, and- Oh man, yeah, like, yeah. And, and that might sound, okay, we'll just sort of 
drive up. Like, it's like it's not that straightforward. Yeah. It might be easy. Yeah. Maybe my man will say, "Fucking yeah, I'll drive it up." But it's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's not that. It's not that straightforward. That, yeah. There's a Could bunch be of things. Four hours that you're in the car to yeah. try get here. And... So that was like that was just like one thing that I knew was going to come up again because what has changed in the last ten years with Dublin? Yeah. Because um, Dublin is always going to be the center, the hub of things. Um. Anyway, fast forward. I interviewed like nine clinical neuropsychologists. Yeah. Fantastic, great experience. It made me realize how much I want to work in the area as well. Yeah. And I essentially asked them a bunch of broad questions without telling them I know what I want to hear. It's a way, like it was explorative. It was yeah. uh, inductive instead of deductive. I wanted them to tell me what was important. So just broad questions to pick at their ideas, pick at their perspectives of brain injury services. And um, it went really well. So oh. I wrote that up. Uh, the, the, the results that were the findings were great I kind of split it in half I have and the first few questions I asked them were what what makes for effective rehabilitation full stop like tell me about those Irish or not and then what about Irish services and how do we do any inefficiencies and things like this so then I had like two kind of groups of findings I had you know here's what makes for effective rehabilitation here's what Ireland does well and doesn't do well and what we could improve on how we could improve on it fantastic so uh, that was submitted on Monday I was very happy with that and, and presenting it tomorrow uh, and then tomorrow night oh yeah we fly to Birmingham <clears throat> we do indeed for the Arnold what is it sports, sports festival? festival yeah something yeah. like that yeah. so we are going to be handling our dear friend Lissus our buddy yeah we're going to be making sure she wins lots of money at our yeah. competition yeah um, should yeah, you tell be... them who she is I don't know if they'll know Lissus Ah, she was on. Go back to <laughs> go back to episode seven. Oh, yeah, she hears that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she's catching straight. She's not even. She's in a different country, and she's, got, she's catching them. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we'll be going over there. I don't really know what to expect with this because it's like a, it's our first experience handling at an international competition. Technically, yes. So it is kind of the best. It's like, I don't want to say it because that maybe sounds uh, not so nice, but it's like. A, the next step down from Sheffield. It's like that caliber of lifters that are yeah. amazing. It's like the, yeah. the best of the best, but they're not quite. It was like an invite it. only competition. Yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. It's GL points based. Yeah. So I don't know how the f I'm gonna figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I'm going to be on Google with the GL formula thing, just typing in random numbers. So thankfully, we have another coach with us. Yeah. Andrew's coach is actually going to be there, yeah. Adam. Yeah. So we'll leave him to do the nerdy, the nerdy stuff. And we will we'll do the funny stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be the moral support. We'll just be like, yeah, that nah, looked like she had five kilos more. <laughs> Adam's there doing formulas and calculations, looking at the other lifters. Uh, that's his problem, man. Anyway, uh, <laughs> nah, it will be fine. I don't think it'll be that. I was going to say, I don't think it'll be that complicated. I don't know what your take is from that, like, coaching perspective. Obviously, there are those, like, little tricks and stuff you can play and jostling for position and so on, mm. which we know how to do. But... At the same time, my perspective is kind of, we'll just make her lift the most amount of weight that she can. And yeah, it's, a, prom it's a combination fun, of both. And it's yeah. only in those last few moments where it's like, okay, what yeah. to put on maybe on the third lift and then you start to... Um, but I, I'm actually very excited. Not only do I not know what to expect, but I'm excited to not know what to expect. I'm yeah. excited to pick up these skills from Adam. Adam's done this a lot. Yeah. He does this a lot uh, at national level competitions and international. Um, so times where we've handled a lot of lifters, uh, but not often have I handled people at that yeah, at that, that are rest. jostling for mm. placings at, and at international competitions. So yeah. I'm interested to see, you know, everything from like lot numbers being affected and everything like this. Whereas normally yeah. when we're handling, yeah. I'm just looking for the for, for my guys <laughs> to have the best day possible, yeah. and then maybe come deadlifts. Oh look, oh, we can we can jump for something. Yeah. 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 yeah, So this will be interesting because you're going to have to be keeping a close eye on the other lifters as well and where they are positioned based yeah. on their GL points and yeah. what we would need and. Um, I can't believe you said you're going to put baby powder in their chalk. That's a fucking <laughs> freak move. Oh, asshole. Yeah, whatever it takes, baby. Yeah, whatever it takes. Yeah. Ireland on top. If you want. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, That's a good one. I like that. That was fun. Uh, what else has been going on, though? How's your training? My training is pretty good. Um, we are like three weeks out from junior nationals yeah, ourselves, something like four, that. Four, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for me, honestly, at this stage, it's like plain sailing. Like these last few weeks are almost just like a, a formality. Like I know where I am and what I should be capable of. I just need to, to show up and do it. And now my perspective with training, since it's changed so much to being like taking the lightest weights that I can essentially, even this week and next week will still be pretty light. And I'll only really push it for my last 
like final week leading into the competition, mm. I know again what number should be there based on uh, the previous block. So yeah, it's kind of just plain sailing. I'm not stressed. Not Does your training for the next four weeks look any different? Nope, it's just the same, same old stuff because we go through those phases of like four weeks where it's like ascending RPE over the weeks. You might start off RPE six, end off near RPE eight, which mm. are, we do singles year round. So it's still the same. Um, the only thing that changes is like the, the volumes that I'm handling on back offs and so on. That's going to be reduced now. Okay. Uh, the intensity overall is going to be that little bit heavier, but yeah, everything is kind of just geared towards being as strong as possible on a single. <laughs> I don't know if you can pick that up on the mic there. <laughs> Someone's going crazy out in the gym floor. <laughs> I am vibrating here. <laughs> okay. And the ground is shaking. Me as well. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about... Uh... Oh, fuck, here we go. <laughs> we were talking about the the reels and TikToks. Yeah. I deleted TikTok a while ago. Yeah? Yeah. I have not used it in on. probably four months. So it obviously just went dead, but it was that kind of TikToky video. Uh, where people are getting ready. It's like a get, get ready, with, ready me, with me. And they're like the throwing gym. stuff on their bed that they wear and they throw a butt plug down first. It's like, but, but like, what, what made it quite funny at the start was it'd be like butt plug, thong, yeah. tra shorts, tracksuit, t shirt, and then it's Bells, a guy. Yeah. It's a guy like yeah. walking out the house. Uh, fucking wear a thong if you want. I just wasn't expecting <laughs> it to be a guy. <laughs> like, maybe Andrew or whatever. But uh, yeah, we were talking uh, about that then. We were saying, uh, Andrew asked, do I have my butt plug in? Because he does. And that. Thank God we're not sitting in the plastic chairs in here. Oh, because you, I would have heard them. Uh, but that's actually becoming a thing. I was saying I saw a video from a guy who's a power lifter, but he's also has a like wide reach. And what was the video? It was the video that you just described. It was nothing explicit. It was, <laughs> but it was the same thing. Get ready with me. And he had the butt plug. And all the comments, since he has like half a million followers or something, it's people who know nothing about powerlifting. And they're like, what does the butt plug help? Why do so many top lifters use the butt plug? Should I get one? Do I need one? <laughs> it's like, there's got to be a cohort of people who are actually trying to get... They're up, man. There's right. always, there's always going to be people who take, like you posted, yeah. if you can bench 50 for three. Yeah. Oh. You can bench Sorry, 150 can I... for one. <laughs> so on that video, again, piss sake, if you can bench 50 for three, 150 for one. I can bench 50 Ev for three, though, and I can bench 150 <laughs> for one. Every second comment, I kept getting comments being like, this is such bullshit. This is not true this guy's gonna get someone killed and it's all like 50 year old men like every time i went onto the page it's like a middle-aged man who was so mad that i said if you can bench 50 for three you can do 150 for one so uh yeah there's a, a cohort of angry people out there as well i also just realized the title for this podcast is now gonna have to be something to do with book plugs, plugs. Yeah. <laughs> we can we can make that the case every single time yeah honestly yeah until i stop wearing mine to the podcast <laughs> so how's your training going Woo. um <laughs> Uh, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. I posted an Instagram recently uh, that a few people mentioned to me, and it was me explaining how when training isn't going very well, you can just not care and it will come back. So I'm hoping that not caring it will come back <laughs> works for me this time. Uh, it's fine. Like it mm. obviously hasn't been as enjoyable as maybe it was when numbers were flowing, PBs were coming. Uh, you know, there was this like double up of success in my training as well, where when I was pushing accessories really hard. I was bulking and I was getting loads of muscle. And then I was hitting PBs on the SPDs. And then after Christmas, a bunch of things just started to snowball outside of the gym. And I, I couldn't pick up momentum again. Everything just felt overly heavy. Hmm. When I was hitting sevens and I took like the heaviest seven I took on squat was 240 for seven. I was like, oh my God, 240 for seven. I went back to that classic, like, okay, well, 240 for seven, 250 for five. The estimated one rep my calculator, I can squat 320. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, my God. <laughs> right? So, yeah, well, no, I can squat 320 right now. I don't think I can squat anywhere near that. Um, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, this block of singles, I started with 230 for one, and it was pretty hard. So, uh, you know, but annoying, frustrating. Mm. Um, but as long as I just like Adam was just handing me to just be like man like draw a line and step over it because it's the only way like I know when you take and you you know I, I watched I take on deadlifts like 250 for four it's like and then when 220 is hard again it's like oh my god mm. uh, but it's like just like A it will come back but yeah. B it, it can only come back if you don't get in your own way yeah. so just like step yeah. over the line Good point. stop caring as you said in your Instagram just stop caring and just go with the flow so yeah. I'm going with the flow yeah. um yeah, I, I squatted 20 kilos more this week. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, technique does weird things when you don't 
feel right yeah and you're like searching for that like even subconsciously Feeling. you're searching for it to feel right and like you're kind of compensating for things being tired so you're like okay i might like extend here more and that just felt shit so just like little things um and that's where we would fall into a trap before of going oh my technique is wrong now i need to go change my stance i need to go change my grip width now i need to go change something mm. but again as we've talked about multiple times yeah you don't need to change anything you just need to keep training keep and allow yourself to build that momentum again with those again they are a lot of weight say if you're squatting 230 for your first single that's what we want mm. and that will allow you to feel good for the subsequent weeks if you came in and you're feeling that fatigue or whatever it is from the previous blocks and you go yeah but i need to i want to squat 300 let's just make up a number i want to squat 300 by competition time so i've got to start at 260 but you're already feeling really beat up and you try to force that 260 yeah. you know for a fact you're feeling like shit the following week so you've gone about it the right way and yes 230 might feel somewhat difficult now but as the weeks go on you'll be able to ramp up that intensity and it'll be totally fine that's the plan and i trust adam and i trust him as to, to load as much as i can possibly lift i feel like he knows my outputs better than me which yeah. is great <laughs> in your coach yeah. so i can just i'm gonna turn you, up five, you just push as hard as you can i'm gonna on for the next few weeks let the intensity build up do my best not look backwards just go forwards prep as best i can and to be honest i know that even if i lift less than my pbs by the end of the the prep and you know i just i don't want to max out in training i just want to hit like a nice maybe like rp9 towards the end of the block confidence build man it, if he loads up 20 kilos more than that on the day and says i'm gonna hit it i'm gonna hit it if he Perfect. tells me some bullshit like you know <laughs> whispers in my ear those sweet nothings that he gives me um oh. yeah you know i'm hitting that shit so i don't mind i don't mind um yeah. everything's so with that everything's good yeah. you know uh in fairness there was something that came up unexpectedly that has interfered with your training so it's yeah. not that you just for whatever reason you are feeling a little bit weaker like there was there were things that were getting in your way outside of your control i don't know how much you want to go into it but i don't mind as long as you don't mind andrew proposed to me <laughs> <laughs> maybe i'll just throw you under the bus then <laughs> under the... <laughs> no so uh <laughs> it, was, it all started i was in the library working away went down to take a piss and uh, i was like damn the urinal must be pretty dirty <laughs> the fuck? after a few pisses i was like that's not the urinal that's yeah. my piss yeah. uh and then the next day i was pissing blow baby it was oh, ketchup yeah. cranberry juice whatever you want to call it <laughs> <laughs> and uh i was like damn yeah, what's what? going on uh so what plugs and pissing blood we got the title for the podcast <laughs> <laughs> no, those are disconnected okay i'm not pissing blood anymore so obviously they're not related <laughs> anyway uh <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Uh, so that persisted. Yeah. Uh, you know, my sister was like, "Look, it's probably just like a kidney infection or some shit like that. It's fine." Kept going. I couldn't take that, so I went uh, to like VHI, got some tests done. They tested piss, blood, everything like that. No infection. Yeah. Nothing like that. Okay. Did like a physical. Nothing. So they're like, "Okay, you're gonna have to get an ultrasound or go to your urologist or both." So I got the ultrasound first. Mm -hmm. Got an ultrasound. Yeah. Uh, and what like, is that? Is that like they they like gel up your yeah belly and then scan it or something? Like when you were pregnant and they yeah. found the oh, yeah. twins. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, for anyone who hasn't got an ultrasound, you like lie back, yeah. obviously, and naked. Uh, they told me to put my clothes back on. <laughs> 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 no, just just belly out. Yeah. And uh, well, top off. Yeah. Titties out and. Uh, yeah, she checked literally every organ. It was like a full abdominal scan. Okay. Um, the whole shebang. And for the most part, didn't find anything that would suggest bleeding. Yeah. So then had to go to the urologist. And he said, yeah, you're going to have to get, you know, the special camera. Uh, and where does the camera go? Uh, it didn't go up my ass, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> uh, and I got a CT scan with contrast as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, nothing. 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 Which is a good thing. So you thing. were faking it. <laughs> Just to get that sweet, sweet camera. Uh, no. Um, yeah. And the, the bleeding had stopped at this point, I will, okay. I will say as well. So yeah. what he said was, whatever caused it was mm. small and likely harmless. Yeah. So there's nothing there. There's no growths, no major lesions, no stones, no tumours. So you're fine. Uh, given there's no infection, nothing like that. So all of that, they ruled out everything that they could possibly look for. Mm. So you're fine. If it happens again, go Come get it checked. Yeah. But... You know, should be fine it's fine and i was like okay 
and then just yeah, left. And, went on. and that was it. So when that was happening, when the bleeding started, training hadn't gone great that week. And then that happened. So I was like, oh, maybe yeah, there's, there's like a infection. Mm -hmm. And then once the bleeding had started, I was very distracted. Yeah. I was even a bit sick. Stressed. Uh, stressed, sick, distracted. You know, I need to train, but I need to do college work, but I'm fucking wrecked and yeah. all this. Now, if a procedure... Training becomes an afterthought when your health is yeah. on the line yeah. or affected. I, I still turned up. I yeah. still trained. Uh, and it will... Like, again, that's why we use RP. We just go and hit the RP, whatever that load is, hmm. um, regardless of what you wanted it to be a month ago. So yeah. uh, I guess the, the, we said before this that I would say that story, uh, A, so people knew I got the, the PP camera, and <laughs> <laughs> B, uh, because it just highlights and encourages the importance of investigating yeah. strain, like anomalies in your health. Looking just, after your health. Yeah, just yeah. fucking go for it. Like, yeah. I wouldn't... Yeah. Not, not your health safe. is like number one priority yeah. so in a period like that again we're whatever it is six weeks out from yeah. a competition that is you need, important you need to we, park we, it. we we cared a lot about but we we talked about it and you're like to be honest that is the last thing of importance at the moment we want to make sure that you're fit and healthy and yeah. we can worry about the rest of that afterwards and thankfully now we're in a position where you are fit and healthy. Where, I'm, where i'm fit and healthy yeah. and i got all checked so yeah yeah if you're pissing blood Go, go get it looked at. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't so bad, was it? No. He loves it, actually. Andrew, Andrew finds out how to, like, dye his piss just <laughs> so he can get his camera. He actually sent me the highlight reel as well. It looked pretty cool. The live um, stream link <laughs> from the camera. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, is that everything to catch up on, I think? Pretty much, man. Anything else? Um, we yeah. are looking to do, in future episodes of the podcast, a segment. We want something that we can come back to and include in every single episode. Yeah. But it just takes a little bit from the listeners or the watchers. Yeah. So we were thinking something along the lines of ask the Andrews. Yeah. Okay. And I was saying shit. But <laughs> yeah, okay. What you're going to do is ask us our opinion on something, which we this is what yeah. we're doing anyway. We're covering our opinions on stuff. But more so, what would we do? Yeah. So, of course, it's a powerful based podcast for the most part. Um, you know, what would we do in your training situation? What would yeah. you do? My training feels shit. What would you do? My coach told me I'm shit. All these things, <laughs> right? Um, Whatever scenario you're going through within your own yeah. training and you would like an extra opinion on or what you think we would do or from our coaching perspective or from our athlete's perspective, yeah. uh, what we think you should do in a given scenario can also extend beyond training Please itself. extend beyond training <laughs> itself because the training ones are fun. Yeah. More enjoyable are what would you do? You know, <laughs> my... What I was gonna oh. say, so, I was gonna say, so I was gonna say something reckless. What were you gonna say? No, nothing. Anyway, okay. uh, stuff, even stuff that's happening in your personal life, because that would be funny for us to laugh at your misery. Get us stuff that you want us to answer, and you know will be funny. Funny, yeah. yeah. The funnier, the better, yeah, or the more controversial, the better. My yeah. favorite, my favorite questions are when they're asking us heinous stuff. Yeah. So honestly, of this Q and A that I put up again. 90% of it we cannot say <laughs> and we've been talking about piss and blood and bubble yeah. 90% of the stuff we can actually bring up now it makes us laugh off air so Thank keep you. keep it going <laughs> look if you can find a way to to yeah. send in when we put up an ask and Andrews the box yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. ask the Andrews box <laughs> yeah. when we put that up if you can find a way to turn your heinous stuff into a question of what we do yeah. because it's but, hypothetical yeah exactly yeah. we'll, we'll you know, give our input we'll give our input because it's hypothetical yeah exactly okay we'll give, we can, I can say anything <laughs> hypothetical you know uh, so yeah so this is a call to action yeah. all listeners all, everybody watching we are going to put up stories yeah for the next podcast yeah for the maybe the one out or yeah, i think for one. every one for every we'll podcast up, like, ask, ask the andrews Andrew. box yeah and we'll do that as a little bit of a segment yeah. and we want we is. want specifically what would we do yeah in your scenario yeah yeah very good okay what else to go see i was thinking what else we have to touch on and i've actually been up to some crazy yeah i hope that it's good on camera <laughs> uh what I've been up to, and again, been very busy. The last podcast we talked about going over to the UK. I was back over again for another uh, product shoot, I guess you would call it, with my pro team. They flew me out in the morning of whatever day it was, Tuesday or something. 6 a.m., flew out to Manchester, got picked up, taken to the my protein HQ, got to look around the offices and all that cool stuff, uh, where like the factories and all are. I didn't get to go into them, but I saw where it was. Then out to a gym do a product shoot the new like products that they're launching pre-workout so on uh got to hang out with more of the like my protein lifters other power lifters and then just like regular influencers 
So that was great for networking and getting to know those kind of people. And my protein are making a concerted effort to push more into the like powerlifting realm, which is very, very good cool to have the, the like backing and support and that push from a company that's so big. So yeah, exciting times going on. Man, powerlifting when we started was <laughs> like powerlifting was the weird thing with red plates on my on my, <laughs> on my instagram yeah. like before tiktok yeah and then with the emergence of tiktok powerlifting that really it's gave big. a platform to powerlifting big. because yeah. the nature of powerlifting is this quick it this quick couple seconds of coolness yeah. Yeah. Uh, or like a set of coolness yeah. that or one rep even like that wasn't picking up on instagram it wasn't yeah. very sexy but on tiktok it was perfect because yeah. it was just like you could just watch it and scroll and i think as well because when i started tiktok i actually wasn't going to go on tiktok because i thought it was like this real stupid app that was like real childish and my girlfriend was like i'm literally going to create an account and post pretending to be you if you don't do it so i was like okay fuck it i will do it i'll start posting on it and i just posted like my training but again since it was such a younger demographic me just posting the fact that i deadlifted 270 was like mind-blowing because it's people who either have never trained in the gym or like they're in there for six months of training so it like it attracted a lot of I was, <laughs> I was gonna say it attracted a lot of young people but let's not go there uh it reached a much younger demographic of people that then became interested in strike sports that's a much better way to phrase it it is a much better way to phrase it yeah uh yeah okay <laughs> you always do that man. You you, oh, bring up the younger man i need you, to be careful what i say Renji, because you're just you got a filthy mind anyway uh so will we get into the question Yes, please. All right. What are your favorite and least favorite things about coaching? And another separate question that is along the same vein. What is your favorite and least favorite thing about powerlifting? You can answer whichever you would like first. Okay. Favorite thing about coaching yeah. is when people have gone through a period of difficult training and things not clicking and we're working and working and maybe, you know, they're becoming a bit disheartened as well. Not that I want that to happen, yeah. but it's, it happens. Uh, or they might even stop. Uh, I have one example. His name's Michael Rannigan. And Are you just selling some guy out here? Or is it a good, uh, it's has a, a good payoff? It's, it's a love story. Okay. Because, <laughs> hear me out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so his training was just, it was, it was kind of the odd time it was great. And then it would just plummet. Pile drive, pile yeah. drive. Um, and we were trying you so many drive things. You were Paul Driver or the... We, we would try so many things. You said so. it was a love story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Michael. <laughs> so last time I bring up anybody. Uh, but anyway, he, he trains in my gym. So we see each yeah. other all the time. But uh, he was he was trying to gain weight. He was doing his best. Uh, he was picking up niggles here and there. Uh, knee pain, things like this. Uh, and we did a bunch of competitions where we were totaling like the exact same thing. And failing like 250 deadlifts over and over uh, and things just became so annoying and he was going through like leaving sir time into college Stressful. he needed a break yeah. he came back we collaborated better than ever i was a better coach than ever when he came back yeah. man the guy's trainer popping off he doubled 250 which was always the um, number we were failing in comp amazing. uh he benched he doubled 140 actually and bench was always like not the good lift uh his squats are blown up his training is phenomenal um, and it's because both of us, both on both both parties are fussing the least we ever yeah, have yeah, yeah. Uh, over the details that don't matter when we're focused on the yeah. bigger picture. And man, he's he's made more progress than probably any other of my clients, and it, it's yeah. he, it's amazing. So that's probably my favorite thing is when people have a dip, which is probably my least favorite thing yeah. when we just for some reason, no matter In what we do, like, we yeah. can't find it. We can't find the 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 special, yeah. the golden root, yeah. and things are just are just fading away but when he stepped back and then said yeah i'm ready to go again i'm ready to go to the best of my ability and i was ready to give him the best coach he is he had had and what it. what variables do you think have changed if you can assess them okay he did successfully gain a lot of weight um a considerable amount of weight and he's filled out his frame a lot uh i don't fuss and don't put any weight on the details that maybe I used to think were important things that don't matter yeah. um, and I don't have any specific examples yeah. it's just now I'm like just okay minor hiccups yeah. perhaps that you would have then seen as like a downtrend in yeah. training that's just whatever we just yeah. keep moving and now you know 
on both of our parts not fussing i'd say that is the biggest variable is like both of us just focusing on the the bigger things yeah um, big rocks yeah we don't care like one session feeling heavy used to be like oh why does that feel bad let me yeah. see what i can change yeah. now it's okay <laughs> next <laughs> session it doesn't matter yeah. and what can we do yeah. productively to yeah. yeah a more holistic view of training and like man it's like fine it's fine awesome you favorite and least favorite things about training um so coaching i would say least favorite thing i'll start off is the stress perhaps uh because coaching is like my full-time job <clears throat> where when you get into coaching you think of all the the positives like you just said there of when you're like making progress and uh so on but you forget you have to run a business then if you are trying to make that your your actual job so having to wear multiple hats i would say of being a coach but also being a business owner and then trying to make sure that you're doing enough marketing so that you can continue to make enough money to survive um which is difficult i would say that's probably the thing that i've struggled with the most but that's i think that's just a product of being self-employed where i'm all i'd say there's a feeling 24 7 of like am i doing enough am i providing a good enough service to all of my lifters which i want to make sure that i'm doing and progressing the service making sure i'm giving them uh, as much valuable as as much value as i possibly can um while also making sure that i'm growing the business so i can afford to actually like live uh, and pay for my groceries and put petrol in my car uh so doing marketing and stuff like that am i doing enough there am i doing enough here just always wondering am i doing enough and stressing about that uh, i would say that's probably the least favorite thing but that's part of it's part of the game favorite thing i would say would be the relationships and stuff that you build from coaching um i just I just love people like i love just the the bonds and the connections that you form with these lifters and like you said when they're going through the trials and tribulations and when they get that that payoff and they see that progress and you see how much it means to them and how much of an impact it can have on their lives and uh people like building more confidence and building up that self-esteem uh that's that has to be one of the best things like when when they are progressing you feel that same joy and happiness that you got when you were like first progressing in the sport and you'd hit those pbs and it was the mm -hmm. the biggest thing in the world you get that except it's times 30 with all the lifters that you have so yeah i'd say that's probably the favorite thing about powerlifting itself favorite and least favorite things uh, uh i feel like it's it's simple things it's obviously i love we love training like it, it's great when training is going well I just love lifting like they're stupid answers i think uh probably the i was gonna say the social aspect but sometimes i love just going in and fucking hitting a set of squats set of bench and an upper body session like is and or a quad session it's it's everything it's like just ingrained in my soul <laughs> to, to lift this is what you do that even like when training was was taking a dip there recently i was like to adam i was like man i could fucking <laughs> fuck this i'm not doing this anymore like i could just bodybuild like i actually really yeah, like it yeah. um uh and i was like i realized that i was like what, what, what am i trying to say i think i was i was suggesting that when I, anytime i go into a comp prep it becomes the str more stressful than enjoyable the the cons outweigh the pros and i was like could i just not compete and i was like well no because i'm strong sometimes and i hit mm -hmm. pbs so why don't i just do pbs on the platform and then I was trying to figure out how to train in a way that is just constantly enjoyable and lower stress. Um, and there is ways to do that. And, I, you know, and then I started naming all the things I enjoy about training and I really do enjoy training. So it's more like yeah. the, maybe the stress put upon ourselves and, the, and the, the psychological response to natural training dips that if you didn't care about the training dips, they're not dips, they're just training. Uh, because I still enjoy training when there's a dip as long as I don't care. Yeah. Like when I'm far out from comp on my my you know sets of six feel <laughs> shit it's like i don't care just yeah. a set of six and i'll go do leg extensions and wobble out of the gym and have a great time so there is I, I enjoy all things about training and i enjoy training maybe that's it i my favorite thing about training is when i can remove myself from the from the judgment and the pressure put on myself i like that mm. i like that for myself i would say mm, favorite thing maybe just like the the sense of uh, I would say like the sense of purpose like just you uh, you have a direction like you're on this path you're on like the journey of self-improvement like every day you're going into the gym you have an objective that you're moving towards this goal 
uh, like you have that mountain to climb. Just having something to do with my day to keep me going and to feel like I'm continually making progress. Like there's, I don't know, people play fucking like Candy Crush and like Clash of Clans and stuff to get that same feeling of like, I'm doing something that is like moving in a productive direction. I'm making progress. I'm leveling up. I'm doing all that sort of stuff. Like powerlifting is just almost like a, a video game where you level up your own just personal 100%. stats while it's also like beneficial for your health to just like resistance train and man know. upgrading your character and being able to just move forward in a direction you're absolutely right yeah. uh there's easy ways to upgrade your character ear pierce <laughs> you know like tattoos are obviously customizing our character yeah. pierce your nose pierce your ear yeah. get a haircut yeah new get clothes tattoos. yeah but training is like this constantly yeah. accessible yeah. and healthy way of doing so and it's like there's no shortcut to it you don't just wake up and be able to squat 300 you know yeah um like there's a level and i view it in the sense that like when i hit this like massive milestone pb it's like no one can ever take that away from me mm. like i have squatted 300 or i have pulled 340 whatever it is like that's a a number that i will be able to like i don't know just like hold with me because my pbs i can't squat 300 kilos for 95 percent of the year but i have done it like i've been there i've yeah I've like achieved that milestone, yeah. Um, which I, I just like that idea of like working in pursuit of this like massive thing that no one can take away from you. Even if you like win a, a competition and things move on, but you always have that medal or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I um, like that idea. There was people on the late late the other night. I was just you know force feeding, gagging, and it was all <laughs> in the background. And Eating uh, food or yeah, both, and, uh, <laughs> both. <laughs> what was it? <laughs> Uh, there was Olympians on yeah and one had an Olympic gold medal yeah. uh, and then two had like gold medals from other things but no Olympic medals and I think one of them was very was really good he's a swimmer uh, sorry for not knowing his name and anyways your man asked him like what's more important the records that you're close to or getting a medal and interestingly he said the medal because Records are meant to be broken, but medals mm. are forever. So you have the medal forever. I but like the, that. the records temporary. Yeah. Now, obviously, I, I would I love the records are broken. I love yeah. the idea of chasing records. But it's actually, I, I like that as well. Uh -huh. You could go to a comp and hit no PBs, yeah. medal. And, it, and that's, uh, the, there's something about like the idea of like, I don't know, your kids, or your grandkids, like seeing this? Yeah. this like medal. And then you get to talk about all the... Yeah. The old stories that you had you got to travel the world you got but to like what are you going to say like trust me i did break that i record. did break the record i, I know it's 60 kilos less than it is on the website <laughs> but that's because back in my day it's like okay it was better like, yeah. uh, <laughs> no the records are, are amazing as well i guess if there's a physical if you got I, a medal for breaking a record then it would be cool right? i was actually thinking about that and wondering if i like i was going to reach out to the rhpf to be like other countries and feds you get like a like a slip of paper that says like you broke whatever record we don't get that just updates on the website so i think like asking them because that would be cool to have to 50 years time when i'm like old and decrepit like if i can look at that and be like oh shit you pull it whatever way yeah. yeah rather than it just changing the website and i know that's more effort but fuck it dude put in you're the effort be, like you're it's gonna be cool. decrepit at 23. <laughs> <Yeah>. bro <laughs> sake. right what's next up what is one thing that you think most people could improve to be a better powerlifter? Low hanging fruit. Man, what was this episode two that we covered that shit? Yeah. What's what's the first thing that comes to mind that you think could do? Stop overshoot. I was gonna say building momentum. Yeah. Not training as heavy the vast, vast majority of the yeah. time. Build momentum. It's it's something that, man, you can implement it in everybody's training, no matter how you train, obviously, unless you want to train at high RP all the time. If you just say start the block easy and don't go hard to the last week. It, it just puts everything else in line yeah. on your SPD. So it's probably that. Yeah, I would say that. Build momentum properly. Like there's there's so little that can go wrong if you just undershoot the majority of your training. But there's so much that can go wrong when you're constantly pushing too heavy. Yeah. You Like you burn out. You just fall out of love with the sport. Yeah. Whereas if you're undershooting consistently, what's going to happen? You just feel good all the time? And you're going <laughs> to oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> like honestly mm. but once that finally like clicks and yeah. that actually registers and you yeah. realize you can still make progress like lifting lighter weights there's that uh, meme where it's like 
why are people in the gym trying to lift these heavy weights? Don't you know the lighter ones are easier? To lift? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I think half the time. I'm like, yeah. why, why are you running yourself into the ground, lifting these weights in your secondary day when you don't need to? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, That's my take. I think that is probably one of the the broadest things that people could do is just training lighter on the whole. You have here momentum, wear butt plug. <laughs> is that just for squats or is that for deadlifts as well? I just think you added that one in. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> what else gaining muscle stop overthinking yeah yeah they're just like easy ones build more muscle honestly muscle is just the key to success yeah. if you want to keep progressing I find I've, it's that I've, easy I also have not found someone who doesn't like building muscle as well <laughs> yet until and it, it, like some people are like oh man fuck sessions and then when you get them to do them well <laughs> yeah. like mm -hmm. you get the, way more fun you get them standing in a picture like this <laughs> like yeah you like that yeah. shit I know yeah. you do yeah so build more muscle like it's just again I remember when I Ah, that'll be another question. We'll touch on that again. Okay. There'll, there'll be a story that I can get into. What do you think separates us from the lifters winning worlds? So this this is an interesting one, I think. Yeah. Um. Because in the actual, like the full question, they're asking, is it just genetics? Is it work ethic? Is it whatever? I think there's a combination of genetics, um, time, and how much they're willing to sacrifice. I would say it's probably a big one. I'd say they're the main three that come to mind. Yeah. Genetics, time that they put in, yeah. and then how much they're willing to do. Are you saying? Are you saying time, is. as in how long they've been lifting? Full probably. stop. Yeah. That that is something that comes to mind. Although there is a caveat to that, where Nonso, Man, the, Antonio. Yeah. Like so, there's there's people who have been training shorter times than us who are stronger than us, mm. and that's where I would say the genetics and so on comes yeah. in. Yeah. Although. I would say for like the majority of people, time is just something that you can't get around. If you are in your first year of training and you're looking at someone who's in their 10th year of training, you can't compare. Yeah. There's no there's no sense in comparing because you, even if you train, if you did everything 100% correct over the next year, you're still not going to be there because you don't have the hours to, to reach that point. They've put in 10,000 hours. You've put in 100. You can't expect to reach that same level. Again, like building muscle you can only like synthesize so much muscle at one time you can't like fast track that progress and now our understanding is like there's a high correlation between how jacked you are and how much muscle you have and then how strong you'll be you can only build so much muscle at so much time you just have to put in those years like you you just have to keep showing up so that is one instance but there are kids who have like nonso he's 19 now he's probably i told with me by like 60 kilo what was he the strongest 18 year old ever yeah so like there are people like that and that's where I would say genetics comes in. I was talking to him and he said like the first summer he wasn't even powerlifting. The first summer that he came in and he was training over like three months he got up to a 300 kilo deadlift. Hmm. That's you're you're not built like that. I'm not built like that. You're not built. No one unless you're non-so the likelihood is you're not built like that. I, I commented um, what was it? He put up a post and he was like 355 like say four months ago and it was a fail yeah and then he doubled it and i was like man i probably would fail 355 right now does it mean i could double it in a few in months, months. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, yeah. he's uh that's where genetics comes in i would say like there's and that's an interesting one maybe we can segue off from that what is it about like someone's genetics that may determine why are some people better than others not even in powerlifting i'd say why are like some kids better at sport than other kids what is it? What is actually going on there that makes some people just predisposed to be better? So are you asking what? What is different about some people that makes them actually better? Because you you can say genetics. Like as in what, what does that mean? Are you asking what phenotypic expression is actually better or more? Yeah, yeah. We're just what in general? What attributes or characteristics do some people have that are just genetically superior? Man, like there's shit that it that goes so far over my head. Like things yeah. like you know the oxygen levels yeah. in your blood like type 1 and type 2 yeah muscle, yeah well. fast twitch slow twitch i'm the sure they're all things like how, like how efficient your respiratory system is yeah. uh, how efficient you are at recovering mm. at uh, synthesizing muscle tissue things like this yeah. so those like things come to mind how much is nature versus nurture as well i wonder though the things i've just listed would be nature. sound yeah. sound like they've uh, 
solid genetic basis yeah. probably could be improved upon like obviously we can yeah. grow muscle then there's fucking shit like epigenetics yeah. that like the way that you act in the nutrition and sleep and stuff that you're exposed to when you're younger makes your genetics like work differently you can like unlock different bits of your genetics to function mm. differently or express differently mm. and it's fucking I don't know the science nerds can figure that out you you gave three cool pillars there though you gave yeah. out of your control so genetics is in that i'm sure there's other mm. things there's not in your control but is in your control which is time mm. whereas if you just if you just give it the time you can't fast forward it but it's not in your control either you, you can't get there any faster yeah. and then there is in your control and there's things you can sacrifice and sometimes i don't like that one because it's like well i do make all the sacrifices possible until you talk to people and it's like man yeah. they've never had a drink in their whole life they do not miss meals when you look objectively at yourself yeah you realize and i think it is only through that comparison talking to other people you realize they are doing more than me they are they're putting in more work than me they're sacrificing more than me now how much like yes they might be say really more regimented with their meals or drinking even less or doing all these things but the percentage that makes up is hard to quantify yeah. um and sometimes their genetics will just determine because we were right. saying before i think we said it uh, there are examples who people who aren't more regimented yeah who do also drink just, more yeah. sleep less and, and who are just health. stronger and make more progress yeah yeah, yeah. So, so there's a lot of variables there's what, a, but a what separates us from the <laughs> the people at the top um andrew still you know won't what bench gonna, with the buffalo what's he gonna fucking say? <laughs> and like bench is oh, important well, on that note i bench more than you so maybe you should take your <laughs> buffalo out when you bench you motherfucker right <laughs> maybe you should listen to me and take it out yeah mm, how about that how does it feel after all these years huh? for all these episodes <laughs> <laughs> how does it feel to now be the inferior bencher when well, I was pissing blood, okay? <laughs> Take it easy on me, for fuck's sake. Bastard. <laughs> kick a man while he's down. <laughs> yeah, kick him, in the, kick him in everywhere. Uh, so, yeah, I would say genetics probably uh, a variable. Um, I was going to say drugs just because of the, it seems to be a theme in the last few episodes and the algorithm loves when we bring up like fake natties and stuff. Uh, but there was actually a question here that goes, why does Blackwood bring up the uh, doping thing that happened at junior worlds when he's obviously doping too the best the best response to this was man if i look like this and yeah. i was on gear <laughs> i'm getting a refund oh, man put me down <laughs> well, if this is what you get when you're blasting fucking i quit man, man. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> but i presume it was a joke but if not i'm flattered that you think i'm flattered I that you like think this gear. bullshit is on gear man <laughs> then if i'm on gear what are the other people on <laughs> fuck's sake uh, yeah mm. so anyway that's that and then there was another one that goes people were trying to get digs in uh they go you're 110 plus how come you're not as jacked as russell or he and gavin aiden brother they are five foot four i'm six foot tall like if what you, you switched mean? andrew down he would also be pretty yeah. <laughs> if you cut me off at the knees then would be uh maybe we'd be level then mm. Mm. So, like, yeah. he knew he heard the laugh and he knew it was us uh What's the next one? What have we got here? What were your numbers when you first started training and how have they progressed? Hmm. So first went into the gym when I was like 13 years old. I squatted 40 kilos. I benched the bar and I didn't deadlift probably until I was maybe a year and a bit in. Yeah. And I think maybe by that stage I deadlifted like 80 kilos possibly. Hmm. And then from then I would say I've actually, it's cool if you look at my open powerlift and see like how my total has progressed since there. But from when I was like maybe 15 to 16 years old, I started training seriously and I got up to like a 180 kilo squat, a 100 kilo bench and then like a 200 kilo deadlift. That was from running 531. I think I ran 531 nine times in a row. <laughs> you'd run it for three weeks, then you'd like deload, test your max, run it for three weeks, deload, test your max. I did that and I was just linearly adding 10 kilos to, to my lifts every single block so just did that rinse and repeat did my first competition just matched those numbers and then from there it's been relatively like linear progress because my body weight has kind of gone up linearly as well i weighed in my first comp maybe like 81 82 kilos 
and my latest one I was 114 mm. so there was the period in the middle where I stayed in the 93 kilo class for too long my total didn't really budge it kind of stayed the same maybe went up a little bit then went down from one competition uh, and then since there that's when I moved up body weight and it's gone up again so there's been I think on average if you looked at it each year I maybe added like 70 kilos to my total every year uh, I think maybe maybe I'm making that number up but that sounds about right to me so yeah I would say <laughs> for myself it's been pretty linear since I started out but that's because I've been gaining body weight Damn. Yeah. what about you? okay uh, when I first started squatting yeah like 45 50 for a few reps uh bench i think 40 for like two or three uh so the bar is embarrassing as fuck uh <laughs> deadlifts again i also didn't deadlift for some yeah. reason until like july i'd started in the january yeah um failed 140 pulled 132 yeah. hmm. uh and then sorry so yeah by the end of the first year i had a few powerlifting buddies and test my maxes squatted 150 benched 100 deadlifted 170 and then my first comp was right. a while after that like a year and yeah. three months after that so two and a, two and a bit years yeah. into lifting uh squatted 215 benched 120 and deadlifted 205 insane numbers for the time and for how old you were why were you so good like what was it what was it about you that was so good because i remember looking at you and i was like this guy is a freak of nature. Like, how is he actually so... And that almost bridges on from asking a minute ago, what makes some people better than others? Yeah. Because there was another question here. Uh, I don't think I put it in, but it was along the lines of, I'm 23 years old or something. These are my numbers, uh, whatever they were. And they're like, I've looked back at your numbers and you were hitting that when you were 16. Do I have any possibility to compete at a high level or should I just do it for fun? What made it that we were hitting those numbers when we were so young? obviously we've discussed a bunch of things yeah. uh one thing that came to mind there though interestingly was in one of our perception modules in college we were talking about how like the basically the variables that influence people's perception mm -hmm. perception being like the the combination of like a physiological and psychological process yeah. of your senses taking in stimuli and your brain processing them and psychologically processing them, processing them. so you might take in one thing and see another you know uh i think you've used the example of when you look for red you yeah. find it but even in things that aren't even red yeah. you start you to like orange, them red, you kinda, yeah. um, and then your perception changes under the influence and things like this um perception is like speeds colors everything any stimulus any type of processing that you can imagine um but one of the influences was culture and we were like oh, what are you talking about um and i think the example study that he used to show us was color perception and how I could get this wrong, but let's say uh, there's there's like blue and pink on the spectrum or something, mm. uh, and there's a color. It's it's like blue fades into pink, and then in another culture there's a color in between them, and they can okay. see it, but okay. we cannot. Yeah, we don't have in, a name for it. We don't have a. We literally yeah. do. Yeah. It's yeah. not even that we're like just skipping over. Yeah, it's yeah. like oh, well, that's still blue, and yeah. now it's pink. Whereas for them, it's like way sooner, yeah. it's this colour, and way bit. later, it's this colour, and then it becomes pink, and then it becomes blue. And they're actually seeing that, they're not just, and we actually maybe don't. Like now, this is, this is a reach, maybe, but I was thinking there, when I was 16, doing those things, what I was being, A, fed by the, the support and, and social systems around me, uh, but B, consuming, and without kind of reining that in, what I believed I could do, and uh, what I perceived, yeah. say, 215 kilos to be on the bar yeah. was different to what another 16-year-old might perceive 215 as. So I, because I, I hadn't been exposed to the world, I hadn't been exposed to the ups and downs, yeah. only you the ups. You shouldn't be able to lift 215 when you're 16 because that's so heavy. Because it's you, not normal. You were just ignorant to that almost. I was ignorant yeah. and all I could see was, well, yeah. that's 300 there, so it's only 215. <laughs> just, yeah, just put it on. It's like it wasn't yeah. that big a deal. And I think that... It's a dangerous line to, to traverse yeah. because, of course, you want to be optimistic about your progress, yeah. but also uh, realistic. Yeah. So I, I think maybe what got me there, and it slowed down kind of, because yeah. what got me to there and maybe up until about 2.30 on, on squat was, I'm going to squat 300 in no time. Yeah. Then once I hit 2.30, that's when the reality set yeah. in of like, you will yeah. not squat 300 <laughs> right now. Things slow down. Yeah. Um, 
but that that that's definitely something to consider. I really I like that a lot. Mm. Uh, that idea that your your belief of what was possible shapes that a lot, and that is something that we have noted from people like Lysis or even Nanto would be another person. They have this belief that it is no, like I will be able to do these things. Like it's that's normal. The self limiting beliefs that the <laughs> the rest of us or most people have just don't come into the equation for them. Uh, I remember for myself, like when I I was getting started like in training in my first year or so, someone told me they're like, oh, you have like a world-class deadlift. Your deadlift is like going to be one of the best. And I had maybe pulled like 210 or something. But that like that stayed in my brain. And I was like, oh, yeah, I am a good deadlifter. Yeah. I'm an amazing deadlifter even. And that belief for myself has then carried through. And obviously my deadlift has been the best lift of mine. Uh, the whole way through be just because I believed that it was I was mm. told someone told me early on that it, it was and then that belief then grew legs and there here. and it's this it's this really deeply ingrained belief as well mm. it's not like you go into the gym and you go oh, yeah no I am a, a good <laughs> yeah. it's that when you put on 220 it's like oh this is this yeah. is not heavy yeah. whereas I spent years believing I was a bad deadlifter and yeah. this is heavy I know I was a bad bencher that was a, yeah. a big limiting belief that I had <laughs> uh, but this kind of bridges into an idea of acknowledging the importance and the effect and influence you can have on other people yeah. and how significant one thing you say right. could be both ways yeah. as in telling someone they'd have no potential and telling someone they have all mm -hmm. the potential in the world and fostering positivity and hope and optimism in, in people uh so important yeah. and you have to understand <laughs> the effect you can have and of course maybe even more so with younger people yeah. uh, with younger lifters um, don't squash their hope like you don't also you, you need to be realistic with them of course but like build on the optimism build on the self-belief um, because it, it plays a part for the, for the rest of their life I would say yeah yeah. there's a, a good book that I like it's called The Four Agreements yes. and it kind of it plays on that idea of the the beliefs that we have we're conditioned with a lot of beliefs that we don't even realise just when we're we're growing up we're like a blank slate and then society and all the people around us condition us with these beliefs and we don't realize it but we agree to those and that's kind of what determines how we act and how we carry ourselves for the rest of our life like there was one um like analogy in the book about a young girl who's like singing in the house but the mum comes home after a really busy day and she's really stressed and she's got a headache and the kid is singing and she tells her to shut up and she doesn't even have a nice voice just to stop singing because her head is hurting and the kid then grows up for the rest of her life believing that she's a horrible singer and she doesn't sing even though it had nothing to do with her singing voice it was just that the mother was stressed and had a headache but again that one thing that you say can kind of shape the way someone carries themselves and thinks about themselves and acts and perceives the world yeah yeah so fascinating fascinating so try cultivate as many of those positive beliefs you, you can about yourself yeah you know your vocabulary is very good mine yeah what did I say? Did I say anything good there? Cultivate. Oh. I like that. Um, we have a list of questions here. There's so many. We're definitely yeah. not going to get through half of these. One that caught my attention. Do you have any good luck rituals or superstitions? <laughs> I'm one that I don't even know if I'll say. But uh, and oh, and come on. One that, comes to mind, one that comes to mind is uh, I have this red Nike t-shirt that whenever I... This was in the home gym specifically as well when I had the feeling that I was gonna hit like a big milestone PR, like when I, I just knew I was good to bench 170 for the first time, so like three reds, for long, whatever long reason. Sleeve. Yeah, I had to put on this like red Nike t-shirt because I was like, three reds, the red, red t-shirt, it, it's just gonna work. And for what, I, like 170 was an ambitious jump for that day, but for whatever, I just knew, I knew that the red t-shirt was gonna give me the power to bench that. And then when I squatted, uh, I think it was like a 270 triple. I knew I was going to load it up. I was like, I have to wear Where is the red t-shirt. I have to get it. And it even, I shouldn't have worn it because it's one of those like, uh, I actually think it's meant like for swimming or something. Not you wear while you're swimming. Swimming. But it's, no, it says like Nike swimming. So I think it's what they wear when they're going to the pool or something. Uh, but it's like that kind of shiny like kind of yeah. material yeah. that like wicks away water or sweat or whatever it is but also such a thin material that i feel like the knurling would actually yeah tear. Like, yeah, yeah rip and it it doesn't actually have any grip so like i i should not have worn it for the squats but i just knew and it was the red t-shirt it was going to give me the power to, to rev 270 like i just need five reds like it just made sense uh so like that i would 
I would have that. Um, yeah, it's kind of the main thing that comes to mind. What are you? Do you have any good luck? I think rituals or superstitions. Definitely clothing was one. Yeah. Maybe I want. I want to know how common that is that people have like a lucky mm. T-shirt because it sounds so dumb. Yeah, or lucky socks or lucky. It sounds so dumb until yeah. I have a heavy session. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's weird, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I I used to, it used to be a set of socks I wore for like my first five competitions. They had dinosaurs mm. on them, um, and then an Odyssey T-shirt that I had, and mm. I war for a lot of my PBs yeah. I kept wearing until it just stopped working because I wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't in you were making progress <laughs> uh, uh, any superstitions now no and I think I've done a good job of freeing myself of uh, of inhibitions I had or, mm. or barriers uh, like superstitions that were getting in if my way if something happened you yeah. wouldn't have a good day or, yeah, yeah. Uh, like things that come to mind <laughs> are like where you are forced to forget them like you know one maybe is like the song like say you're listening to music and it stops like and it oh, used to, fuck, like, it used to be like oh well i have to sort yeah. the music now it doesn't matter yeah. uh that sounds so silly another one was at um i want to say euros in poland i took out my second attempt 260 squat and they hadn't tightened the clip and it like has slid most of the way off and that one rack took so much out of me but then we had to put it back yeah and then I have to unrack it immediately again. Yeah. It's not like I went back in and came yeah. back out. It's like yeah, you're up in. again, like yeah, yeah. Yeah. So being able to execute in those being able to remove the idea that oh my god, I'm wrecked. I need to sit down yeah. to just like okay, I can just fucking squat. That's so freeing. Yeah. Uh, and I try to cultivate it in my lifters as well, where I'm benching with people and yeah. they're putting their wrist straps on. I'm like man, just fucking lie down. Yeah. It's like just fucking just lie down. You know, you don't need to do your setup in yeah. case you you get into a situation on a comp day where yeah. you have 20 seconds to do the rep now from the time you go out onto the platform you don't have the time to do your setup or if you would ask to put the bar back you're fucked you're done yeah, yeah. Uh, because you have to do your setup again so just be able to do things quickly and you don't have a superstitious yeah you need yeah. the perfect setup or the perfect routine I like that a lot and that's also something I've I found and I don't know if it's just like happened through experience you've been put in more of those circumstances where you've been able to perform despite something being off uh, but like I feel like I have this resilience to my uh, like potential how I can execute regardless of the circumstances like you said if the music goes off I've had enough times where you're in a weird environment where you can still you can still execute you can still do whatever you needed to do uh, I've had multiple competitions now where I've maybe got like four hours sleep the night before and still gone out and hit like a massive PB total so like I I have no concern now if I get a terrible night's sleep before a competition I'll still be able to perform or I've had it twice where I've unracked a squat and had to re-rack it because for whatever reason one time the i can't believe this still pisses me off the thumb loop of my wrist wrap it wasn't around my thumb it was just dangling out was brushing against the bar there must have been maybe like a centimeter of the thumb loop that was touching the bar from my third attempt squat at world championships and gaston shouted from the the jury table i think they said something about like protect the game and like go by the rules so they made me re-rack it again uh, and I unracked it I think I had four seconds left Man. to get the squat and I still smoked it so like being able to to do that is such a I don't know it's like no matter what happens I'll still be able to execute mm. Andrew posted uh, and it was the six lift idea it was the, <laughs> it was the like how to make powerlifting more fun <laughs> have two attempts on each lift someone <laughs> All the comments were like, yeah, no, this yeah, This is amazing. No. This is such a good idea. The Rising Lifters page shared yeah. it. It was getting yeah. shared everywhere. People were liking it. Some guy commented, this is a fucking stupid idea. Two likes. <laughs> One of them was Gaston. <laughs> Gaston saw this. <laughs> went into the comments and was like, how do I make this sound stupid? I don't want to say it. Uh, oh, this I just saw another one. Bam. 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 This is fucking stupid. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> Oh, I'm getting all reds at my next <laughs> there goes, That's the fucking guy. That's the guy. Protect the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. oh, that was funny. I forgot about that. That's amazing. But that was another one. So many people misinterpreted what I said, but I clipped the video like poorly where everyone thought I meant let's add like three more exercises to power. Yeah, I saw that. People were like, what? Overhead press Yeah, and row. then bicep curls. <laughs> Do you know what? I did a deep dive on, I can't remember what it was for. I think it was for, to make like a post about something. Uh, like what are the origins of powerlifting because I was wondering like was it all equipped when did raw powerlifting become a thing and the like origins of powerlifting was a thing called odd lifts which has like 50 lifts that you do it's kind of like strongman but it's like 
cheat curls and fucking like single arm overhead press and all sorts of weird lifts and you just max them all out and then oh, that's man. your like total yeah so it's called odd lifts and apparently it's still like a thing that is around and then in the early like 1970s the IPF was formed and then they made uh, like the powerlifting as we know it but bench used to be first really it used to be bench squat deadlift oh, and no, then no. they did that for maybe one or two years and then they rearranged it to squat bench deadlift mad wow and then it was only in like 2011 that the IPF made the classic division so it was equipped up until like 2011 didn't know that yeah mad yeah. now there was other uh, federations that were like raw that had like no knee sleeves and some had sleeves and whatever but IPF didn't until 2011 that's insane and the reason that like other federations started to splinter off is because the IPF wanted to start doing drug testing and then some of the like the big like the OG lifters who were like massive in just powerlifting at the time were very against drug testing. So they're like, fuck this, I'm making my own federation then. Yep. And then it was like USPA was made or whatever it was. So yeah. It was the UK and USA, which were like the two main places. And then the international referees for like world championships, it was a guy from like the US, a guy from the UK, and a fellow from like Zambia or something. And he was like, apparently Zambia just had like a guy who was just representing everything the for guy. like yeah, yeah. years. Wow. So yeah, they were the OG powerlifting nation. Man, I was going to ask you who do you think would win in a fight? You or Sam Sulik? <laughs> <laughs> Why? So maybe just tell me anyway. Me or Sam Sulik? Yeah. I'd need to size him up, you know, in person. Whoa. <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I asked who would win the fight, buddy. What the fuck? We fighting or fucking? <laughs> Uh, Whatever you want, buddy. Let's go. Uh, there's that Omar Isaf line, I think. It was putting her fucking... <laughs> he's uh, very funny, actually. Yeah, no, Omar. he's gas. Uh, um, nah, Sam Sulek. He's too big. He's too nice, man. He wouldn't <laughs> fight. Yeah. We wouldn't fight know. each other. I don't know. Mm. Give me the answer. So, bro, I'm not fighting Sam Sulek. Because we're taking him on the podcast next week. That's Andrew's way of saying he'd win. <laughs> <laughs> like, Andrew he's thinks he's going to go win. viral. Sam Sue like, fuck this guy. <laughs> sees me at the Arnold. <laughs> like, text you like we're fighting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think he's too big. Yeah. I'd say he's run around a little bit and he'd probably get tired. He wouldn't want to fight. Who? Him, you or him? <laughs> <laughs> you both like get down your backs and say <laughs> you're doing. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> butt scooting jujitsu. Like, uh, <laughs> he'd fall asleep. <laughs> Pulling guard. Uh, uh, anyway, well, it's something, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> come on. Um, <laughs> that's next. Okay, there's two here that are basically the same. Uh, maybe we even answered this already, but it's if you could go back to talk to yourself when you started powerlifting, what would you say? And then what advice would you give to someone getting into powerlifting? If I have to say watch episode two of this podcast one more time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah we touched, we touched yeah. on low-hanging fruit that you can go for. Yeah most embarrassing thing that has happened to you in the gym so yeah actually do you know what i think i have something uh to add on to the last one go if i could go back to myself i would say don't be so scared of failing first and foremost because i used to hate competing for that reason uh and keep in mind the long game you just enjoy training now there was so much of training that i hated because i was so focused on like numbers and so on again which we talked about in that episode but just keep in mind the long game like you you don't need to rush it you don't need to be perfect you just need to keep showing up so if i could go back and say something to myself when i was starting out just keep the long game in mind enjoy it enjoy each training session don't put off the enjoyment in the hopes that when you hit this pb that it's going to make up for six months of being miserable in the gym uh, enjoy each training session and then good things will come from that it's a great one uh, and i was just trying to buy time about the embarrassing one because <laughs> this is not in the gym european championships 2021 my opening deadlift dead quiet stadium just ripped ass <laughs> massive <laughs> massive fire on the platform got picked up on the mic like it's in the stream where you could just hear me pfft, like just farting so loud and as soon the as i walked up, like I was oh like, my god <laughs> I was like, he's oh, gonna fuck. have to check that one <laughs> Yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was not great. Was it? Uh, in the gym, man, there's honestly none that come to mind. The only thing 
no one knew obviously yeah. but the most embarrassing thing I can remember is one of the first few times I maxed out uh, I'd seen Russell maxing out or lifting and uh, he had like white powder all over his legs so I chalked my legs <laughs> I had no idea. Was this for deadlifts? Yeah. Oh, so you said just for like squat or something? <laughs> Even <laughs> worse. No, I full on chalked my legs. I was like, yeah. damn, that was lucky. It was hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a good one. That's a classic. For one. anyone who doesn't know, you need to wear baby powder on your on legs. legs. You remove friction, not chalk, which, <laughs> which adds friction. friction. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of anything else. There's a f- like, I know of multiple people, thankfully, I've never done it, who have uh, scutted themselves on the platform or in the gym. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they've, there's been bits left over after a fight. Bits of so. poo. Oh, yeah. in, in their clothing, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not on the platform. Man, there's yeah. a guy, I'm not going to out him in case yeah. it's a story he doesn't tell. Yeah. But he told me at the time we were sub juniors, he won his weight class and was going to get drug tested. And he said, uh, I'm just going to have to go to the toilet. And they're like, oh, we have to come with you. And he was like, no, like, my singlet is full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Like it's like a nappy right now. I need to, I need to wipe the shit off my legs. Oh my god! I'll tell you who it was. After. Yeah. <laughs> it's real. It's real. Oh my god! Yeah. yeah, there's. I know a guy who has shit himself every competition that he's done. Every single, and he's must have done about fifteen. <laughs> You know he shits himself when he lifts as well. That's not just the competition. That's in the gym he's shitting himself. Oh, fuck. Wow. Oh, uh, yeah, funny. He purposely I, brings a few pairs of jocks. Like, I had know. a guy tell me as well, and I'm not going to name any names for this one either, but he was saying he was going on a run, yeah. and he was like, he's training for a marathon or something, and just for whatever reason, the vicinity he was in just was not anywhere near a toilet. Shit himself on the run. I just kept going. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and then he went to the gym, because the gym was the nearest place, and then like got changed. I, he said he put the, the shorts and stuff in the bin. I'm not sure if he put them in the bin in the gym or if he ran home yeah. with them like in his arm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I was like, so was it like a conscious decision? Did it just happen? I don't I didn't get like the full details, but yeah. Imagine trying to run with it. But Goggins and stuff does that, doesn't he? No, he fucking doesn't shit himself in a run. No, he man. doesn't. Are you kidding? Goggins has absolutely, definitely shot himself in a run. This brings us to the, to another question that I'm interested on in your take on. Yeah. Because we disagreed on this before. How to politely <laughs> tell someone they need to wash their knee sleeves slash that they fucking stink. <laughs> I was thinking about this one. <laughs> and my take is if you say it to this person directly, all right, that's yeah. not going to be nice. So... What we'll do is we'll clip this. We'll post this online. You can share this to your story. So anyone who views it is going to think, am I the stinky knee sleeve person? And everyone's going to wash their sleeves. Or if you're really brave, you can just send this directly to the person who stinks. (laughs) But that's the most neutral way. That's the way I go about it. You can share this. Do share that. Uh, One thing I like to do is walk into the room and go, (laughs) did someone shit themselves? Especially when there's only that person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> then you leave saying nothing and they're like, they're like, damn, I must oh. still smell. Yeah, uh, that's bad. That is, a, that is a topic though. Right? Would you tell someone? Like, would you go up and be like, bro, your sleeve actually... You'd ha- you'd if someone's do- sleeves stink, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because it's it, not a personal here's thing. Here's the thing about stinking as well. And I know you said it was a bit of a personal thing. But if someone all of a sudden stinks, you just tell yeah. them. Yeah. Just tell right. them. If someone stinks all the time, they know. You have to be a bit more because because they probably yeah. feel that there is like a hula hoop around their waist of like three meters, and for some reason, <laughs> people do not enter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> As they walk, like the to negative keep... end of a battery, you know, like put the air there. <laughs> oh, and a shark swims through the fish, the and the fish are all like, <laughs> <laughs> yep, uh, yep, yeah, um, yeah. That's a tough one, though. You like it's you have to be tactful if you're going to tell someone they stink. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, it's just funny. Okay, this one I'm pulling up for you. Oh, he's going to make something No, up, how do you avoid comparison to other lifters? Okay, that is a, a very good one. I like that. Because I fell into this, I would say, over the last like week or so. Since I went to that event for the My Protein, like that photo shoot. Because now I am like associating with people who are just like, better than me whether they're stronger than me or they're in better shape than me they're like leaner more muscular uh have bigger 
Whoa. And <laughs> what goes on in these my protein offices? You were you were sending me way too many smiley selfies after that. They have bigger uh, like following or engagement or whatever, uh, earning more money, like all these kind of things. And I'm essentially like the very bottom rung of the, the ladder. Yeah. Now affiliating with all these people who are just like have just crazy social media platforms and so on. So I over the last like week or so, I just had this weird like feeling of like dissatisfaction or like being kind of dejected where I was like, why do I feel kind of shit right now? Like, what, why do I, what, what is this feeling? I don't really understand. I didn't know what was going on. And it just carried through for a few days until I kind of realized talking through it. I was stuck comparing myself, say, in terms of the amount that they were earning or the followings that certain people have that I'm affiliating with or how strong the people that I'm hanging around are now or how much leaner they are than me and comparing all of the ways that I lack to these people that are now in my circle. And this is not something I was consciously thinking, but like in the background, I was kind of like, man, you are so fat and weak and ugly and shit and no one cares about your engagement. No, you're just not doing well. Obviously, in objective reality, that's not true. But for whatever reason, my perception at the time, because I'm now surrounded by a new circle of people, was comparing myself. And it was only through identifying that and saying, oh, that is kind of the source of what I'm feeling right now, that I was able to remind myself, that's exactly what I would tell other people not to do in the sense of, if you're looking at my numbers, but it's a guy who's been training for one year, Again, you're not going to be able to compare. It's apples and oranges. How are you going to, as someone who weighs 70 kilos, compare what you're lifting to someone who is 110 kilos? Okay? Just entirely different scenarios. But if you are so focused on that uh, like objective endpoint, how strong you are, how much money you make, how much whatever it is, you're only setting yourself up for dissatisfaction. And I found even with the content that I was putting out, I was like more concerned with these vanity metrics of likes and followers and views just so that I could compare it to these other people rather than what I try to do the vast, vast, vast majority of the time is make sure what I'm putting out has some sort of value to it, whether it's through like information or entertainment or so on. That for the past like week or so kind of fell by the wayside because I was just concerned that oh, this video isn't doing well. I'm so far behind. These people are 20 times better than me or I'm, I'm not strong enough. I'm not lean enough. I'm not whatever. A any sort of comparison that you could make. Now I've reminded myself in the same way that I would remind other people with training. Just focus on the process. Focus on all the things that are within your control, giving your best effort. So now in terms of content, that's an easy one to to identify just make sure you're providing value enjoy the process of making the videos try to make sure that you're you're doing something beneficial for other people that they can gain something from it and take your happiness and fulfillment from that not that someone else has 800,000 followers or whatever it is and you're you're saying that gap between me and them is so much how am I ever going to get to that stage and be on the same level as this person uh, take your your value and your self-worth from other areas, not these objective outcomes. So that is something that I fell into. I would say the only thing that helped me was just being aware of it, identifying it first and foremost, and then bringing it back to, again, something that I can relate to more, which is training, which I would talk about quite a lot, not comparing your mm -hmm. chapter one to someone else's chapter 10. And focus on the process, focus on all the little things that are within your control within training and take the enjoyment out of that. There's no way I'm adding to that. <laughs> that was perfect that was perfect yeah anything you've learned recently that surprised you hmm anything outside of powerlifting just like I feel like I was gonna say that uh, the origins of powerlifting that was probably a, yeah an interesting one um, yeah that's the first thing that comes to mind I don't know is anything for you I think there was something about like fruit or something lately <laughs> Do you know? Do you know? I have like an allergic reaction to apples. Now. What? Yep. Yep. So weird. And obviously, I've eaten apples like all my life, but lately, for whatever reason, <laughs> like when I eat an apple, my like mouth will start to get like kind of swollen, and my like throat will start to swell up a bit. Yeah, man, I can't actually swallow or anything. Uh, and then I'll get like bumps on the inside of my mouth that only last for 
half an hour, I'd say, until I like mm. wash it away with water. And then I've like tested the hypothesis like 10 times, I'd say, to see if it is apples. And every time I eat an apple, that happens. Now, I don't know what makes more sense to me is it's like maybe pesticides or something that's on like the outside of it. So I've tried like washing them as much as I can. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Seems to be an allergic reaction to apples. You're allergic to anything else? Nothing that comes out. I have hay fever. That's a hay fever shit. Man. Yeah. You're just allergic to like outside. That's mm -hmm. fucking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you ever tell people so. about you getting your nose cauterized? Oh yeah. So I used to get, and that is to, that kind of builds on from the hay fever because whenever I would have hay fever, you'd like, sinus gets super inflamed or if you have like a head cold i would get no i was the guy who would get nosebleeds i would just wake up in the morning like covered in blood streaming down my nose like uh in my leaving cert so i don't know what the equivalent is in other countries uh, like a levels or something in the uk i was like just writing down next thing you know like geography exam blood all over the page that i'm writing on uh just would consistently happen i would probably get training i'd be squatting next thing you know you're just pumping blood out of your nose uh so i'd maybe get like five nosebleeds a day and it would get worse when i would have like a head cold or something or i'd have hay fever and it would get like sort of inflamed up in my sinus so twice i had to get my nose cauterized where it's basically like a i don't know it's like a little utensil like a pen they, they just like stick up your nose and burn all the skin around the inside of your nose uh so that it like scars over and then will stop bleeding Ugh. so i have to do that twice i still get nosebleeds every now and again yeah, Matt. I, man, <laughs> the the only thing that I there's been a few things lately that uh that surprised me actually, and I was like, oh, didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, one was actually I just watched the insertion of the bar, uh, contraceptive. In, oh, yeah. <laughs> what it's are like, you talking about? Man, it like they make a little slit. Yeah. But then like put in an instrument that like lifts the skin up to make the gap. Yeah. And then like they have to like. It explains in the video. It's like a tutorial. It's like Why make sure make sure you click it all the way, otherwise it won't be inserted properly, and you have to restart the process or some shit. So like it's literally like a thing like under the arm lifts the yeah. skins. So there's a little gap, and then it like you have a gun. It like and in it goes. That's, yeah. Yeah. If you would, have the bar, would, tell me if it was sore. Would you it. get like a male contraceptive? Would yeah. You? yeah. 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 Fair play, man. Well, like, would you get a bar if you had to? Yeah. Jeez. Would you take a pill? No. Because of the... there's so much stuff. I don't know, like, I was about to no... say, the hormonal yeah, effect or cause... actually just the taking of it? Uh, no, like the hormonal yeah, effect. There's yeah. so many, and again, it's not my area of expertise, but like negative side effects from yeah. being on the pill. So now, I'm sure there's plenty of people who are on it and it's fine, but yeah. there's uh, an ungodly amount of people who yeah. have had like negative things happen from it. I, I, from many drugs I get I, I do understand why you're waiting till marriage and it, it helps because it, it's it's a natural contraceptive and you just uh, don't do it until you're trying to have kids because that's yeah. obviously yeah, exactly. the only purpose you know exactly <laughs> where, I have no idea where we are in the just question. choose one that you like uh, how do you manage periods of high stress I don't <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I fucking uh, don't uh, uh, <laughs> how do I manage periods of high stress you close your eyes and do your best like and wait till it's over fair i would say yeah it depends like what the source of the stress is of like, course yeah for myself the majority of the periods of high stress are just when i have like a lot of work to do yeah and the way through that is you just do like you do the work man you just yeah. accept that it's, a sh that it's shit yeah. stop stop like hoping for it to be good stop looking for a hack to yeah. make it better there you is just no... you just go head first jump in into yeah. the deep end and accept that you are trudging through this swamp until you're on the other side because yeah. it's like my thesis. It's like, what was I going to do? Yeah. Just not do it. No. Or like <laughs> find a shortcut like to write it. No. Yeah. I just have to do it. Like There is no perfect time. This is something that we talked about uh, a little bit where like the, there is no tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. Like that whole idea of if you don't want to do something right now, the likelihood is when you say I'm going to start the diet on Monday, Monday is today. You are going to feel the same on Monday the way you do right now. So if you do not act on something right now, you're never going to act on it because when you say you're going to act on it is right now, mm. if that makes sense. I know that's yeah. a little bit wishy washy Tomorrow like, just becomes today. Yeah. So yeah. how you feel right now is how you're always going to feel about it. So accept that and do the work. Eat the frog, the saying, like do the do the hard thing. <laughs> man, you cannot what? tell me that. Eat that's the a frog. Thing. You man, better fucking up. Google it, oh. you man. 
Google it. Eat the frog. I swear to pull it up there. Pull it up on the screen. Pull it. Pull it up, Mario. Mario, will you pull up? Eat the frog. <laughs> eat the frog. I guarantee. You. Another one is like action alleviates anxiety. So when you have that feeling of, oh shit, I have so much work to do. Eat the frog. Told you, right? That hurt. Uh, <laughs> Twenty-one great um, ways to stop procrastinating and get more done in less time. There you go. Eat the frog. So yeah, action alleviates anxiety. That's another one that I use a lot. Um, where when you have that feeling of like, oh shit, I have so much work to do. Uh, that feeling is often worse than the feeling of just doing what you need to do. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, <laughs> uh, you ready for the next question? Yeah. <laughs> what was that about? The next question, how to not show your cock while wearing your <laughs> How to not show your cock while wearing a singlet? Strap a bag, obviously. That's what all the best lifters do. <laughs> I was going to say, I normally take it off and leave it in my gym <laughs> bag. <laughs> Man, shout out to the guy. I don't know what comp it was. I don't know when it was. I don't know who you are. But you wore a white singlet. <laughs> And you have, <laughs> you know, when we say don't care about what other people think of you, that's it. <laughs> Wearing a white singlet, that was. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Amazing. I was reading the questions as you were talking. That yeah. caught me. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah. How do you not do that? Um, this is just That's why we all do the sport now, so we can all look at each so other. We can see, man. Honestly, yeah. if, like, it's, it's a very natural process. Once I start training, it disappears. <laughs> it's like the blood goes everywhere else. Your, your body's body. like, you don't need this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if, you know a good one. i guess uh, <laughs> how do you overcome self-doubt oh so that's kind of i guess it's is that similar to the the periods of high stress similar ish yeah. um depends what the source of the self-doubt is from you know and I, it actually uh bridges on to whatever we were talking about earlier of those beliefs that you have about yourself and where yes. did they come from yes like is it a rational or like irrational source mm. for yourself there. Mm. Like, are you doubting yourself for no good reason? Because that happens quite a lot yeah. where you just, your perception that you're taking for whatever reason, you're telling yourself that you're no good and you're so shit and everyone else is better, which I think we've all fallen into. Uh, and maybe it takes a bit of conscious effort to train yourself out of that, to train yourself to have that positive self-talk again. Um, what comes to mind for you? Uh, we talked about it on the last episode or the episode before, and it was essentially falling back on the bank of experience that you have of I've done this over and over again, or mm. I've pushed through hard reps over and over again. I've done exams, I've done assignments, I've done whatever it is. And you rely on your experience. And then if you, in the situations where you don't have experience, where the self-doubt is for something new, then you build it up. You start slow. You take one step at a time. You, If you're new to difficult lifts, then you just have to try difficult yeah. lifts. Start and, and own it. Like if you're new to something and you're not good at it yet. Yeah, own it. No Love problem. It. Yeah, no it's one actually, is point perfect at everything. It's actually like. kind of a cool spot to be in. Yeah. Uh, not, because especially as you as you get older, I say this for 22, 23, yeah. like it's, it's yeah. you know, we're, we're still young. But as I've gotten older, it's, those experiences are less and less where you're brand new to something. And it's, they're fun. But it also happens, I don't know if you would have been the same in school, where so you don't know something in class, but you're like scared to say that you don't know it. Mm. Or like there's those memes where it's uh, like you're on a building site and the, like the experienced person, when you don't grasp something that they've been doing for 25 years immediately. <laughs> it's like when you, <laughs> you hand like your dad the wrong screwdriver. Yeah, so you pretend like you know what you're doing and someone's like, are you okay? Like, do you have everything? And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just and you're so much it. better off saying, I don't if you know. don't like if you, you're not meant no one expects you to be yeah good at something that you've never done like man my parents obviously taught me from a young age uh you know it doesn't matter yeah. uh, if you don't know something never be afraid to ask and never never worry about other people's perceptions of you like you know who you are and you know that you're doing your best and all these things love them for it uh from a very young age i was never afraid to say in class I don't, fucking get it. I don't know and I would I actually would advocate for the class sometimes I'd be like 
no one gets it. If I don't know, <laughs> like I got the highest score on that test there, on that multiplication <laughs> test. Uh-huh. If I don't know this, <laughs> Commander eating a snot has no idea what's going on. <laughs> Simplified a bit, but now, now, even even in fourth yeah. year of my psychology undergrad degree, uh, I love opportunities to say either I don't know. Yeah. I'd love to know if anybody else knows. And I'm not saying other people don't know. I'm saying, does anyone else understand this? Because I don't. And then also, I love saying an answer and they're like, nope. And some lecturers are really blunt with it as well. Some are like, you know what you'd expect. Kind of like, I get what you're saying. And I can see what you're saying. And that's actually a really good point. Some of the lecturers are like, no. (laughs) Fucking idiot. (laughs) (laughs) Get out. (laughs) They're not even talking about that. Uh, Uh, Or there's one. Your thesis gone. There's a very funny one because he's so nerdy. And uh, sometimes people will say something and he'd be like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> someone else he's really like oh, okay <laughs> moving on <laughs> how'd you get through this many years <laughs> yeah oh, that's that's good. Good. will powerlifting ever be a mainstream sport why why not I'd say if everyone had to wear white singlets it would become mainstream <laughs> way more <laughs> quicker uh, my take I, I wrote down a few things for this I don't think so right now there are things that are like going for it in terms of like social media has been a massive benefit to powerlifting, I would say, in making it more accessible. More people are aware of it. But I think there's a lot of people who will only watch the head, like Instagram highlights of powerlifting and not be invested enough to go watch a meet or uh, anything like that. Go to World Championships, go to Sheffield. I think there is way more of a draw on the social media side where it is just like a 10 second clip of something, someone doing something crazy. But in terms of like filling out a stadium, I don't necessarily think so. Now, maybe you could in terms of like real diehard, like powerlifting supporters, maybe there would be enough of those who would go travel. But in terms of being like a mainstream sport, like football or rugby or something like that, no way. I don't think so because it's too long. Meets are too long. So that is the whole idea for the, like the six lift meet. Maybe, maybe we need a different name for it the two attempt meet right two attempt meet uh it would make it like 90 minutes for a whole meet which is the standard kind of like viewing time for and, other sports yeah. yeah but then you compare it to something like football or rugby where there's always something like dynamic happening or even like fighting where there's just always something going on with powerlifting openers boring okay so boring second attempts a lot of the time kind of boring as well Third time's the only real, like, interesting part of it when you see people jostling for, for position. And it's only really, like, two or three people. So you might watch a three-hour meet just to see one person that you care about lift for nine minutes. And three to six of those minutes are kind of boring. So we all like powerlifting as coaches, as lifters, because we know the other people doing it. We are invested. I'm invested when you go lift because I know the amount of hours that have gone into the training. I know and I care about you. Someone else who has never met you before does not give a shit about you or what you're lifting unless there's stuff like the SBD interviews where you get to know and be invested in the lifters as people makes it a bit more of a draw. Again, we probably need like shorter flights as well. Like those kind of, what are they called? Like prime time flights where it's the very, yeah, the very best people. I think it's eight people. Um, The very best of the best or like Sheffield so few and far between like to have stuff like that that is engaging the full way and even with Sheffield I'm sorry the openers are boring still yeah. like there's at least an hour to maybe an hour and a half of powerlifting meets that are boring bench press <laughs> boring until it's like the third attempt and one guy is going for like a, a world record it's not engaging to people outside and not involved in it and I think another barrier that I haven't heard talked about too much is a lot of people it, unless you train you don't have a frame of reference for why something is impressive. Yeah. If I tell my parents I squatted 200 kilos today and I tell my parents I squatted 320 kilos today, their reaction is going to be the exact That's same. like Whoa. two of me yeah. or three they, of me. They have no yeah. frame of reference whatsoever unless you train and you have an idea of the level of difficulty that there is involved in the task itself. I will say there, so there's not like football, people watch football who yeah. won't don't. ever yeah. play football. But there is a lot of people who go to the gym. It's getting more and more popular. So yeah. there is, it's giving rise to it becoming bigger. Bigger, bigger than it. Will it ever be football and rugby? I no. definitely agree. It, it yeah, never, never will be basketball and nothing. Um, but like... It's going to get bigger. May yeah. have said that about the likes of UFC. Um, now, yeah. do, I think that, that 
plays on a different side of human yeah. nature where it's like you don't even they, need to fight to understand the fear yeah. they, Whereas, they say as well about like fighting I think that is the most entertaining thing because they say like imagine you're watching a football game and two people start fighting beside it so you're turning <laughs> it off the fight <laughs> or hockey yeah, yeah, know that yeah, and they're yeah. like man let them fight <laughs> like when they start fighting <laughs> let the refs ref, ref the, the fight yeah. and not the game like uh, so like that is obviously just very entertaining given what it is yeah and um, would there be a way, okay, so I was thinking there, okay, so how do you make it 90 minutes without shortening the flights? You just show the highlights, but then it's not live. And that's mm. kind of, yeah, live live, is, yeah. live sports is what's interesting because then everybody after the after the game, after the, the comp would be like, oh my God, did you hear this? Yeah. Did you see this? So is there a way to make it possible? Maybe not on like everyday competitions, the open competitions, even nationals, but say, say the, the comps that would be aired. Mm. Tell me, does this make any sense? For the only bits that you have to watch in the 90 minutes are people's thirds yeah. or seconds but and thirds. But still happening in the background. That's so it's like the the aired platform. It's like, the it's like say, if there's like four flights and they're happening staggered mm. so that it keeps showing the seconds and thirds or the thirds across the board and just, you just don't see the rest on those, TV. Just take those in the warm room. That's the other possibility, right? That's Where it's like, like just you just come out, one, yeah, but you come out and do a room. third. That's man. That's I know that's crazy, but that's why two attempts. I think at least gives you like because the people who who were against like the two attempt meet, they were like, oh, it makes it so hard. At least if you have three attempts, like your first one just gets you on the board. Yeah, that's what's boring about it. And get rid of that shit. Do that in the warm up room. Also, if you're so concerned about like needing to get on the board, make smarter attempts. Like I don't know. For a lot of people who are competing, maybe they've only done like a competition or two. Anyone who has gone to like many, many competitions or done many competitions, I think they know how much of like a, a long day. It is a long day. Can be. Very long day. Because um, yeah, if you're in a flight of 12 people, it could be like 15 minutes between your attempts. You could take three minutes between your last warm up and what would be your opener in the warm up room and then cut that hole down, like the whole opener period out of it yeah and you get to hit the same weight and oh, i don't know i think it's a better idea any ideas yeah send them in send them in i'm gonna get a monster from right here <laughs> it worked away um what is the next one <laughs> uh we'll probably wrap this up soon enough i feel like we've been going forever cool uh ba -ba 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 -ba. what to do when training is not going your way uh just you know cry and be okay better <laughs> um what to do when training isn't you're going your way uh obviously there is a little bit of inspection to do yeah is there like why isn't it going my way there's because there, there's it's possible that it's actually something you're doing wrong yeah. uh, or something you're training or something your training program is is doing wrong yeah. maybe you're coaching your nutrition your sleep and i feel like a lot of the things we say are in response to when you're doing all those things right but most of the time or a lot of yeah. people a large percentage of people are not doing all those things yeah, or not looking at that. Maybe they, they are overshooting all the time and things like this. If you're doing everything in your power to make training go right, like I, I had been when my health took a dip and then it wasn't going my way, you just have to stick with it. And it's yeah. so cliche. It's so, I, we say it all the time. It's like, you just have to not care. But it's like, there's, there's a couple options here, right? There's like, there's keep going and not care. There's stop and then there's change something yeah. considerable what what they're they're kind of teared there if you want to stop stop but that's obviously not the answer you're looking for yeah. if you want to change something accept that accept what comes with the change which is maybe oh i'm prepping for this competition singles aren't going well i want to do sets of five do sets of five but you're it's going to feel pretty weird going into the competition or you just keep doing what you can do take all the boxes try to build momentum as best you can get back in the wagon and it's going to put you in the best position you can be stop comparing stop putting pressures on yourself accept draw a line cross over it accept what's going to be it's perfect. Yeah. Perfect answer. Yeah. yeah. To to build on that, I would say be as objective as possible if you are doing everything right. Because a lot of times we can kid ourselves and say, I'm doing everything. And you're eating like shit and you're sleeping like shit and you're super duper uber mega stressed and you're overshooting, but you're telling yourself that you're doing everything right. Be objective. Are you doing everything right? Um and if you honestly believe that you are. I would say for myself, when training isn't going my way, pulling back is generally what gets the ship like back on the right track. More often than not, it's because I've been lifting too heavy and I'm carrying too much fatigue where I feel rough and I feel beat up and I feel like shit. 
and then I pull back, I allow myself to reset, and then you start feeling good again. It's crazy how when you stop trying to run yourself into the ground with super intense weights, how good you feel within training. So I would say pulling back is probably a good place to start for most people. If you want to set yourself up in a position where you can rebuild momentum, obviously if you're approaching a competition or something like that, you need a bit more of a nuanced approach, but make sure that you're doing everything right outside of the gym with your nutrition, sleep, stress management, load selection in the gym, um, and just allow yourself to pull back, get things back and feeling good. You know, when you're learning to drive, yeah. or even when you're not and you cut the car out, uh, what do you do? Yeah. You stop. stop. You turn. You turn the key. <laughs> you turn the ignition back on. Yeah. You go into first. You don't just fucking <laughs> stay in the sixth figure. Maybe <laughs> you, you stop. You slow down. You start again. You pull back a little bit. Yeah. Uh, build momentum. Change again. the tires. Fucking my squat stance is off, bro. Yeah, I change the tires. Not. You just yeah. stay there yeah. calmly. Yeah. Reignite. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Um, there was a situation where someone was saying that they're going to go into a heavier weight class approaching competition because they're only in their first or second year lifting and they would have had to do like a water cut to go into the the lower class they asked our thoughts good sounds call great yeah sounds fantastic <laughs> it sounds like you know the answer already if you've yeah. listened to our previous podcast you know what we're going to say which is the best case scenario i think that's the best thing that could come from these podcasts is we give enough of our insight and thoughts that someone is in a position where they have like this idea and they are faced with a situation and they know what it is that we would advise already and then they can make that decision for themselves absolutely yeah, yeah it, i don't see any reason why this would be a bad idea either yeah uh without any other context um what if you're on like a weight loss journey or something and you're not you don't want to go into the 105s because it would add stress for the comp day sure lift at whatever weight you're at like 106 or 110 and stop losing weight for four weeks and then get back on the weight lost train but that's very yeah. that's a reach yeah, like a, it, otherwise there's no yeah. there's no reason the right would be a bad idea. You made the right call. Um do a naked podcast. We already do. Uh, Andrew has nothing on underneath <laughs> his t-shirt. <laughs> we were uh, saying that like if we had no bottoms on, y'all would would not know, know. Until I like passed on my monster <laughs> you get an absolute flash. Um opinions on getting too fat as an intermediate lifter. I feel it's different to when high lifters uh, high level lifters get fat will this be the last question um yeah i think so okay opinions on getting too fat as an intermediate power lifter feel it's different to high level lifters it's interesting i would say in general don't get too fat yeah it's probably a good idea yeah uh i would say what is too fat see like i don't know have you ever got one of them dexa scan things or one of them body scans that shows you yeah i would say that is probably like the only real way you would know like your body fat percentage yeah i would say you'll know when you're getting too fat you say that man but people's perceptions yeah, of what fair, what fat is was too fat. we've yeah. been leaner and thinking we're fat true, so true 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 well like we saw a video where uh it was, it was mike israel saying don't lose sight of your abs now he's referring to that in the instance of like physique competitors i would yeah. say but i would say it's not too far off what it's you not too do. far off yeah. and I, I i'd say it's maybe slightly different i think uh, female abs look yeah, different as well different. so he, he's yeah, making yeah. kind of a male statement there yeah uh i guess we're at a point where like the muscle yeah. the abdominal muscle still contours you'll, you'll the fat get, yeah you'll get a shadow in the yeah. right lighting if you're um, getting no shadow if it's just pure round belly or there's like your boobs are like hanging <laughs> like guys, or, guys yeah no god like if you're like having like overspill like in your boot and like a muffin top and stuff like that <laughs> man i have a muffin top like. i know yeah i know but if it's excessive yeah. um and you have no uh, like maybe 20 over like 20 percent but maybe 20 to Definitely don't go over like 25% body fat, I would say. Now, I don't know, look up online, like those comparison charts of what that looks like, I That's guess. Like it's, man. Uh, but yeah. I would say, yes, you don't want to get too fat. We want to stay in a relatively good body mm. composition. We're not, that was something I was always aware of, like with powerlifting. Like I don't want to get, I don't want to look like I don't lift at all. And even now I know because I'm willing to like try, be as competitive as possible in the 120 class, for this year, my last junior year, I'm probably going to be a bit pudgy like by the end of the year. I'm okay with that because I know it will be such a short-term thing. Mm. And after this year, I'm coming back down 
no matter what. Like I'm not saying 120 after this year. So I uh, guess the question is is asking about that is as an intermediate powerlifter, yeah. you're doing it for international yeah. performance. Yeah. What about if you're if you're lifting half of what you're lifting and you're saying it's for performance? Do you think that's yeah. a worthwhile trade off? I would say don't don't get too fat. Uh, I would say you're better off then doing like a recomp, coming back down to uh, a nice body composition. Maybe you're down closer to 15%, 12%, 10% body fat. Um, We're not saying then, don't gain fat. Yeah, but you're going to set yourself up to then have a long run of being in a surplus then. You might get nine months, 12 months, 16 months of a, a surplus out of that phase when you strip it back down. So that would be the cycle that I would continue to go through. I wouldn't right, try not to go too far beyond 20 to 25 percent i'd keep that as like a very hard cap you don't want to be like 30 percent body fat for no reason um bring it back down between 10 15 percent somewhere you can see abs and then go back up between there especially as an intermediate you've no there's no benefit to getting over 25 percent body fat no you will the bulk the bulk benefits just start to stop yeah and the cons and you, outweigh and you, the pros. And you feel shit and you like, don't feel good in your skin. You don't feel confident going into the gym. Man, like that. maybe that's where too fat is. Yeah. It's hard to, uh, to objectively say and quantify, but it's when the cons, because yeah. there's always a pros to cons of your bulk. And it's when they start to, here is probably the, the peak end of your bulk is where the yeah. cons of your bulk are like starting to annoy you as much as you enjoy it. And then once it tips over in any situation, and I think that that is generalizable because that level to me, that, that body fat percentage to me is different to you and different to someone else, but it matters because it's yours. I was going to say that. It is subjective where certain people's tolerance to how much body fat that they can hold will be different. For someone, when they reach like 20% body fat, they could feel so horrible in their skin that it's not worth it to yeah. keep going more. Someone else could be more comfortable with it. I would say, yeah, that's a, a very good point that you made there. Um, in general, I would still keep like 25% as like a hard cap, just for your health in that sense. Um, but yeah, how, however it feels for you, if you feel so uncomfortable in your skin, but that's a fine line as well because, because there's you could been feel times where- when you're really lean, you look yeah, fantastic, so. Yeah. There's been times where I'm like, oh my God, I feel so fat. And then I like, I just stick on the path and I gain like another five kilos of muscle. I'm like, oh shit, my physique actually looks way better now because my delts are bigger and my back is bigger. And, Whatever. So it is. A, it's a hard line to to walk. Get a coach who will be yeah. objective with you. Yeah. Um. That will help. There's one more. We'll just throw it in. Uh. How do you program high frequency bench four times a week plus in terms of volume, intensity, variations, so on? I know we we're, we're probably gonna leave this out, but you bench four times a week, don't you? Uh. I was benching four times a week. My pecs were getting super sore. I'm not gonna attribute that to four times a week, but in order to avoid the pain. I took out a contributor, which was a bench exposure. Yep. So I'm not saying benching four times hurts. Yep. Uh, I did bench four times a week. I have people who bench four times a week. Ooh, that's going to come down to the individual. And it's th that kind of specific question asking about like the volume, the intensities. It needs to see that's that's like a broader question as well of like, well, coach, how do you, yeah. How, <laughs> that's, um, people pay me for this stuff brother so how can we make that into like an actionable answer so my take on it is I don't have anyone who benches four times a week um, and I this is just my personal take I think most people probably don't need to bench four times a week like if you're new to training unless you're like a particularly advanced lightweight male or again kind of like What's lighter light? weight what, what are we talking sub maybe sub 100 yeah <laughs> I would say like I'd say like sub sub ninety ninety three yeah, yeah. Uh, m like maybe or you're like a super like Sean Noriega mega arch, high arch like really small. low rom uh, maybe you can handle more but I would say for most people you probably don't need and especially like younger lifters the majority of the audience that listens to this like people who haven't been training for ten years you probably don't need to bench four times a week. Um, you can probably make crazy good progress benching two, three times a week, eating more food, pushing your accessories hard, and that will have a way bigger carryover than trying to add in an extra bench day. Noriega had a competition recently. Uh, for anyone who didn't see, he benched five attempts. Did you not see that? No. You didn't see that? No. I heard something about it, though. Man, two of them were, like, wrongly disqualified because one was, like, your thumb isn't fully around the bar oh and some shit. God. And he was, like, that's not a rule. Yeah. And then they, and then they met, let him again. take it again. Yeah. So he did five bench attempts. Anyway, after that, he was like, an experiment I'm going to try. Uh, 
is <laughs> really? like like I only use the lockout portion of my tricep, so I'm gonna like just, just do tricep really extensions heavy, in that range. Like, yeah. What do you think of that? Oh, like go for it. Like he said something about like it's like fact one. Uh, triceps don't respond to like uh, what do they call it? like length mediated man, man, fucking get get him a mic in the tail in the room. Yeah. Yeah, I think all I know for myself is when I've trained like the really long Length and range. It feels amazing. My triceps have grown. Fantastic, yeah. Like uh, mad. So I don't know where I haven't seen the information that he's saying it's a fact that the triceps don't respond to that. My triceps seem to respond to it pretty well. I don't know. Uh, that's not the best determining factor for if it works or not. But uh, yeah, he can try it. He said it's an experiment where he's just going to try the real heavy end range. Go for it. I'm I'll interested to see. Yeah, see what happens. Um, I will continue training my full ROM and then add on the length of partials. That's with me. All right. That was a long one. Yeah. It was good. Never Everything heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> and never will again. Yep. Uh, all right. Wrapping it up. What are we? Never heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> you do the outro. Uh, <laughs> okay, guys. Thanks so much for listening to episode 10. Yep. Uh, please send in uh we're gonna post oh, yeah. about it but yeah. ask us things what would we do yeah. in this specific situation your situation lifting or non-lifting yeah. if it's not lifting send it to me because i'm the fun one okay <laughs> send the lifting one to andrew yeah. uh thank you so much for listening i'm andrew row underscore odyssey on instagram odyssey strength.ie for coaching or dm me uh i'm andrew blackwood underscore on instagram andrew blackwood on youtube evo powerlifting.com for coaching thank you very much and we will see you after the arnold yeah